My buddy, Swanson, full steam ahead. Over there. I want to go over there. I'll move over, Swanson. I'm driving. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm Sal Mercagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, and welcome to this edition of What's Going On in the Suez, the Move Over Swanson, I'm Driving Edition. Uh, today, uh, not a lot going on in the Suez today, but I do want to talk about some interesting stories about what's going on with the crew, and I've gotten a lot of questions regarding driving vessels like the Ever Given, so I thought today I'd take a moment and talk about driving. How do you drive a vessel the size of Ever Given? So let's go ahead and uh, share some of our uh, uh, screens here. Hang on a second, let's go ahead and pull some of this up. Let me get rid of this right here. Uh, so first off, let's talk about a couple of stories that are in the news right now. Uh, so one of the things I thought I'd share with you right off the bat here is this story. Uh, this story is out there concerning what's called force majeure, a short-term fix for supply chain emergencies. So one of the big issues that's going on right now is Evergreen, the parent company for Ever Given, along with the insurance companies and along with everyone involved, would love to have this event declared what's called a force majeure, a act of nature. Uh, if they can get this as an act of nature, as they say right here, a legal doctrine that can excuse parties from contractual obligations when circumstances beyond their control intervene, it's basically an act of God, but under maritime law, we call it force majeure. Uh, if they can get this declared a force majeure, then they would be out of liability issues because it wasn't our fault, it was the weather's fault. And that's going to be a strong effort that's going to be done here, whether or not Ever Given can get that done. We're just not sure about that. Just, you know, we're just not exactly clear that's going to happen. Now, Ever Given is still in the Great Bitter Lake. She's still anchored there, uh, no movement, canal, uh, canal traffic as normal. Uh, southbound convoy has just finished passing her. Northbound convoy went by a couple hours ago. So we're seeing traffic moving in the canal as normally. One of the things that's really interesting, for the very first time, we're getting images of the crew. Uh, this is from the English Sun. Uh, Ever given crew smile for group snap after mega container ship caused global trade chaos. Uh, there we see the crew of the Ever Given. Our first time we get a chance to see the crew. Uh, so that's a, a good sign that we're able to see that. Uh, we also get this from, uh, uh, this is out of India right here. Uh, other images, same image right here. Indian crew members from Evergiven had visitors for the first time since the ship ran aground, subsequently refloated on March 29. The crew had been subject to investigation and inquiries. General Secretary and Treasury of Mumbai-based National Union of Indian Seafarers said the visit to Ever Given now stationed in the Lake of Great Distress, or uh, the Great Bitter Lake, depending on, on who's naming it, was facilitated by the London-based International Transport Workers Federation. So they wanted to be able to get representation from India on board to see them. Now, people have been on board. I mean, you've had salvagers, you've had inspectors, you've had the American Bureau of Shipping on board. So we've seen a lot of people come on board, but now the crew is getting their representation on board. Uh, and so that must be in one of the lounges on board the vessel right there that they were able to get on board and, and talk to them and just make sure their, their welfare is good. The ship will be able to get food and water. I'm sure they'll be able to get hus what they call husbanding uh, services. So there's no danger of that. Uh, vessel has plenty of fuel on board. They can keep operating. Uh, there may be an issue with water and pumping off waste. They may need to have some barges come alongside to take off some of their oily waste and, and uh, contaminated waste from their, uh, uh, basically their toilet service. Uh, that may need to be done. Not sure they're making fresh water in the Great Bitter Lake, so they may need a water barge to come out to provide some water. But the ship is operating, and more importantly, they will have to keep uh, operating to maintain the, the temperatures in the refrigerated the reefer containers on board. I'm also going to do a, a video here shortly on, on how containers are loaded, unloaded on a vessel, the screening process that's done on these containers, a lot of questions about that. So I'll put something together that shows you that. And then finally, this story right here, uh, again, everyone's favorite digger uh, is in the news. This time, uh, this is from Business Insider, South African edition. Suez Canal bosses say the excavator operator who helped free Ever Given is getting a bonus. Uh, Abdullah Adel Gawad standing on his excavator. He is the one who manned that little excavator that everyone talked about. Uh, is getting paid. Really did not want to be an internet sensation, as as he tells here. Didn't like it, uh, but you know did his job. 
Uh, and uh, more importantly, he wanted to get paid for it, which I can understand. Uh, that's a, a big job. So what I want to do today is talk about driving a vessel. And I'm going to link you over to two series of videos that I think are absolutely fantastic. Again, one of the things that I think is very important to do is to give you access to uh, videos that have uh, uh, basically the, uh, the ability here to share expert opinion with you. I, I, I was a seafarer. I sailed for, for a variety of years and then worked ashore for a variety of years. Uh, again, my information is a little bit dated. So I got two videos for you to look at. And the series are excellent. I, I strongly recommend you head over to their channels and watch them. The first one is from Captain Kate McHugh. Kate is a uh, graduate of the California State Maritime Academy. She sails for Celebrity Lines. Uh, she's quite a sensation being the first female American master of a cruise ship. Uh, she even had an all-female bridge crew for quite a while on board until the pandemic hit. Uh, but she runs a video where she shows what it's like to run a mega cruise ship. Now, mega cruise ships are not the same as, as uh, container liners, but in case of the bridges, the, the similarity is there. The other one I have for you is, is a series of videos uh, done by a current sailing mariner, an American, sailing on board container ships. Smaller than ever given, but in many ways similar. So I want to show you clips of them because, again, uh, I, I think they're, they're really important for understanding them. So here's, first off, uh, Kate is, is master on board Celebrity Edge. She's one of two masters. They switch on and off on board. Celebrity Edge is a, a huge container, uh, excuse me, a huge passenger liner, one of these big, huge mega cruise ships, very much in the same guise as the ultra large container ships. Uh, this series right here, uh, How I See It, again, is on YouTube uh, very well. Receive. Kate has a huge following, not just on YouTube, but on Instagram. Uh, her Instagram uh, account is, is, is fun to watch. Uh, so she, she uh, films a lot on here. And, and one of the things I want to show here is I want to play just a, a little portion of the video, and then I'm going to come back and say a couple of things. The terms steering, navigating, maneuvering, or just to keep it in layman's term, driving is used. There are several different methods that we use to quote unquote drive. The first, and what everyone is interested in, is always the ship's wheel or helm. Surprising to most, it's smaller than the wheel in your car. It doesn't have to be the gigantic wooden wheel with spokes from back in the day because today everything is electronically linked. It's still made out of wood though, at least on the edge. The wheel is usually used when we pick up the pilot until we're close to the pier and then again after we've left the pier until we drop the pilot off. A smaller version of the wheel is you guessed it, called the mini wheel. It's the same idea as the helm. Turn the wheel to port and the ship will go to the left. Turn the wheel to starboard and the ship will go to the right. So I want to go back to this image right here because I think it's a really good one because uh, you get a good uh, perception here of, of the ship's helm. But there's a couple of things that you should know what's, what's here. Operating the ship's wheel, most of the time vessels are under autopilot, and she's going to talk about that in a second. We'll go to that. But one of the things I want to show you right here is what's called the steering backup unit here and a steering backup unit here. Should you fail your helm control, should your primary helm control fail, if that's what happened on every given, again, we don't know. You have backup units, backup units that allow you to immediately switch, literally a push of a button, hit it, that unit assumes command, and now you're steering with a handle, basically. It's the same way with this, except you're using a handle and you're moving the rudder that way. Same thing here, this unit fails, you hit the backup unit, boom, you're on the backup unit, you're steering immediately. So a helm failure should give you this. Now, of course, if you lost power to the vessel, if, if power failed throughout the vessel, then even switching over units would, would not be, success, uh, be uh, uh, successful. Uh, you do not tend to actually physically steer the vessel with a human unless you're in what's called constrained or, or, or uh, um, busy waters, uh, because it's just more efficient to leave it on the autopilot. Autopilots are basically a system. And there are different forms of autopilots. And let me uh, go over here and uh, let Kate talk about that because she does that right here. Let's pull it over here. It is the Ectus, which is basically a digitized chart computer system, which has replaced paper charts. There are no longer paper charts used for navigation on any of our celebrity ships. In the Ectus system, we can plan a specific route, double check it and make sure that it doesn't pass over any land. And when we engage the system, the computer will keep us on the red dotted line or track plus or minus five meters at all times. 
Because it's so precise and the ship is constantly adjusting to stay on the track, it means that it's not the most fuel efficient option. For that reason, we tend to use the autopilot more often. The officer of the watch puts in the heading they want to steer and the ship will maintain that heading. But the wind and the currents could affect the actual course by pushing the ship further away from the track. So the officer of the watch must monitor it to ensure that we're still on the intended track that we want to be. So you had two things there. What an autopilot does uh, basically is you set a heading, the ship will go on that heading. If you set it for 135 degrees, it will keep the bow pointing at 135 degrees. What Kate was talking about there, the Ectus uses all GPS, all the inputs into it to make sure that it is going on a course line of 135. In other words, the bow just isn't pointing 135, but in case there's wind currents, the bow may actually have to point a little bit off track. That was the issue that we believe happened with Ever Given that she was a little bit off track because of the wind pushing on her. Now you wouldn't use any of these automated systems in the Suez, you'd be on, on manual control at all times to be able to give helm orders. <clears throat> but this is an example of the types of systems. Ectus takes a lot of input from GPS and uses that. Uh, if you're on Ectus uh, and your GPS goes off, you can wander off course. You can basically move. If GPS is spoofed, if the GPS uh, is, is not accurate. I, when I had a vessel I was on and our GPS was not reading right, it was one of the early GPSs, but that was because the navigator in the vessel failed to input the height of the antenna into the GPS. It had us at sea level in the antenna when the antenna was actually about 85 feet in the air, which threw an error into the system. Uh, the autopilot will just follow a course. It doesn't get any inputs. It's just looking at the gyro computer, the gyro compass. The gyro compass is an independent thing. You can't hack a gyro compass. It's an independent motor. Uh, but it just reads what's on the gyro compass. And the gyro compass points to true north, not magnetic north, true north. And it bases its course on that. And, and that's the system that you basically use there for moving along. Uh, she goes on here to talk about, uh, I'm going to let this play, but I'm going to cut the audio here. Once we second. get to a port. So one of the things she talks about is taking pilots on board. Uh, these are pilot boats coming out with a pilot. Pilots provide subject matter expertise in local areas. Uh, one of the most dangerous things pilots do is get on and off vessels. It is absolutely horrendous how some pilots have to get on and off vessels. This is a nice short little ladder for them to get up. Uh, but many times pilots have to climb really long ladders and, and those ladders are not always well maintained. Uh, pilots are extremely professional. Sometimes you'll see them travel in pairs like this with a, a senior pilot and a junior pilot uh, learning the ropes. And again, pilots do not take over command of a vessel. They provide expertise on the vessels. And one of the things I would tell you is I, is I strongly recommend you, you watch Kate's videos. I think they're great. Uh, she's got an entire series. Uh, she does. She has a lot more followers than I do. Uh, 37.7 thousand followers. So, you know, Captain Kate McHugh is definitely uh, one of those uh, uh, people uh, I, I would watch, uh, and I do, and I follow Kate, and I think, I think she does a great job. The other one is this one right here. This is the Maersk Montana. A smaller size vessel, if you go back to my video on the evolution of container ships, she's a smaller size vessel, uh, I think around 8,000 boxes, Good sized vessel. I mean, she's nowhere near as big as, as ever given in the ultra large container ships. But this website here, this is uh, 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 Brian Boyle. Uh, Brian Boyle does this. He has, again, 17,000 subscribers. I don't have anywhere near that. Come on, people, subscribe to the channel. Uh, but he does a great job talking about this. And his vessel is a bit older, 2006. Uh, so it's not a newer vessel. The edge is much, much newer and, and ever given is much newer. But here he really talks about this. I'm going to let this play for a minute because he does a really good job of this. Yeah, and I'm going to show you a little bit of the bridge equipment in more detail today. So this is the chart table. This is where paper charts used to be kept. But now that this ship is completely paperless and using digital charts, we only have paper charts for reference. Per Almost all vessels are going to electronic charts now. That's the norm. Uh, the electronic charts are easier to update. Uh, plus, if you go somewhere you don't expect, you can download the chart instantaneously, whereas before you had to order charts. Uh, you didn't carry charts for the entire planet. You would need a vessel the size of your vessel to carry just the charts. Charts have been replaced by the Ectus, which is the electronic, electronic chart display and information system. This one is made by... 
that's the same exact thing that uh, Kate McHugh was talking about. Ectus is a fairly generic term, and there's different brands of Ectus. They're not all the same. I transist, it's one of the most common ones that you'll see out here. And it, uh, it works really well. You can do a lot of, uh, a lot of really quick things on here, like um, measure distances. Just by moving the cursor around, you can get different ranges, bearings, positions. It's easy to edit routes as well, just by moving around waypoints versus having to do it all with a uh, pencil and eraser. So one of the things you would do as navigating is, is verify that Ectus is accurately tracking. So you just saw him talk about range and bearing. So for example, if you had a, an a aid to navigation, a lighthouse, a buoy, or more importantly, something ashore, you can basically at the same exact time take a range and bearing. In other words, how far off the bow the, the, the object is, and then a distance, and compare it to an actual range and bearing you may take with a physical computer, uh, with a, a physical uh, gyro compass on the bridge wing repeater, and your radar. And you can sh check that Ectus has you accurately. So there's always backup. There's physical backups for all the computer systems that are on board. Next up, we have uh, Faruno radar. These are new to this ship this year. We have two, there's an S-band, this is this one, and an X-band. And I'll show you what those antennas look like after this. And so the old radars were these big, huge monstrosity things that, you know, we have cathode ray tubes and they would heat up and take forever. Uh, and obviously everything's being replaced now by flat screens, but the same thing, you're, you're using your radars to do it. And what radars do is allow you to see distances. So there was a talk about Evergiven being hit by a sandstorm and losing visibility, these radars would allow you to see through the sandstorm. You would see the canal, you would see the size of the canal, you would see any objects in the canal, the sand would not clutter the radar. You would be able to refine it so you'd be able to see. So you'd be able to use the radar to be able to track you exactly where you are at all times. Units that are identical. He's showing GPS units. You have two GPS. Almost everything is paired on a ship. You have a, basically a backup for the backup. So you have redundancy at all times. So you'd have two separate GPSs uh, doing this. And, and remember, you even have your phones that can pick up GPS uh, if you need to. So you have a lot of elements here that allow you to use GPS and, and, and different methods on the vessel to basically move yourself around. And what he's talking about is putting in uh, trip data into the GPS. Again, you have redundancy built into bridges. And again, this is a ship built in 2006, but this is a basically updated, you can update the equipment on a bridge fairly easily and see exactly uh, what you need. And probably every given was very similar to this. I don't know the layout of a Golden class container ship. Uh, I've not seen the specifics, but bridge layouts tend to be fairly similar, especially in terms of the equipment and the style that they have on board. So that's definitely something you, you can expect to see right here is something uh, similar along these lines. Compared between over the ground and through the water. Over here is the helm and the autopilot. There's two autopilot units. This is the autopilot two, autopilot one, only one. Okay, that light doesn't blink like that. That's just because of the, the shutter thing right there. That's not an issue here, but uh, very similarly, you have your two autopilots, just like Kate was talking about different autopilots. Again, you have backup after backup on vessel. As used out of time. This is a gyro compass. So the helmsman will be steering here. We'll reference this gyro compass heading. Yeah, let's go back DHF. for a second to what he talked about there because it was a good image here. Again, hang on one second. Let me uh, get to that point here. Let's go back here just a second, a little bit further. So he's talking about the two autopilots. You can switch between your autopilots in case one fails. And then you can always have your gyro compass right there again, which gives it. So for here, one of the things you see right here is beyond the, the wheel here, this is your backup steering. This is your backup steering. In this case, you just have one handle on the, on the edge. You saw there were two handles for two separate units. You would still have two separate units here. Just use the same handle. Uh, they would use that. Again, you have backup for backup. Should your primary helm fail, you always have the backup. And again, your primary helm could fail for a variety of reasons. Not gonna lie. I had. A, coming into a, an anchorage in Bahrain and literally the wheel fell off the vessel. I mean, literally the screw came loose and the wheel fell off. 
and we had to go to the backup unit until we could reset the wheel. And we were very worried about going back to the wheel because we weren't sure it was lined up just right. And again, something you would never expect to happen happened. And so you, you, know, you learn how to do this switch over very quickly onto this unit and, and steer the vessel. Uh, Brian has a whole series of these videos. And again, I, I really recommend it. I'll have uh, his, his series on here. I'm gonna use some of his videos uh, coming in. I wanna talk about containers on the vessel, what happens when you come in to do onload, offload. He does a great job explaining it. I, you know, again, he's firsthand, he knows it. Same thing with Kate, they know it firsthand. But again, one of the reasons I like to uh, use their videos is they're showing you information. And I wanna put it into context of Evergiven for everyone involved. So I hope you enjoyed the update, uh, a little tour around the bridges of the Celebrity Edge and the Maersk Montana here, and using them as examples of what it's like to be on a bridge of a vessel during this. I'll have links to each of these videos along with the stories I mentioned in the show notes. And as always, please subscribe uh, to the channel, uh, hit the bell so you'll be alerted when new videos come up. I mean, Kate and Brian are killing me here in subscribers. Uh, but again, they lead much more interesting lives than I do. I'm a lonely historian in North Carolina. They are sailing the world and entertaining and delivering the goods uh, for everybody. So for this episode of What's Going On in the Suez, we've over Swanson, I'm Driving Edition. I'm Sal Mercagliano. Thanks for tuning in. And I will see you in the next episode.